and um, you have heard so many things about the great contribution that Wolfgang have made in different fields of demography. So you might be thinking that what else that he hasn't done. So my role here today is to highlight um, the very important field that Wolfgang has put forward, which is population and climate change. So um, there are many things that I want to cover in these um, 20 minutes, 25 maybe. <laughs> so the, the, the first part I just want to emphasize, which Brian already covered, how um, renewing demography is to the research on global environmental change. And the second part, I just want to quickly summarize what, what Wolfgang has done in this field. Then um, the third part, I want to sort of highlight the major work that we have done here at the Wittgenstein Center, especially since I joined in September 2011. And lastly, I just want to um, say a few words about what are the future agenda that I think that could be important to keep Wolfgang busy for another next decade or decades or so. Um, right, so I think I don't have to emphasize this anymore, how human being is at the core of the global climate system. On the left-hand side, the impacts that of human activities on climate change. On the right-hand side, that would be the impacts of climate change on human beings. So there's no other discipline as relevant as demography to study global environmental change. In fact, if you see all this headline news, it's all related to demographic behavior. The first one, climate change is Oh, I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> the they claim that the increase in temperature sort of reduces sex drive, and that's res responsible for the decline in birth rate. And well, uh, then the heat-related death would increase as is the older population it would get impact poor women by climate burden. So this is sort of stuff, you know, differential vulnerability that, that we already study in general in demography. So fertility, mortality, um, migration as well. So this was a headline news from Time um, last year during the search of migrants in Europe, how climate change is behind the search of migrants to Europe. So it's, it's, it's really relevant on, to, to, to the core demographic topics anyway. But let's look at the reality. Um, so I'd like to thank Francesco Billy and also Mark Louis for helping us getting this EPC data. So it's, um, the, we have the data on the papers presented at EPC, so the European Population Conference over the past 10 years. So it's six conferences um, from 2006 to 2016. Um, if you look at the distribution, actually it hasn't changed much over time. Basically, um, the topics that have been presented at EPC is uh, dominated by the green one, fertility, as you would expect, the pink one, mortality, aging, um, the violet one, uh, migration, and a very tiny little blue thing there, it's, um, it's a session on um, history, development, and environment, sort of fluctuating between 3% of the share of the paper to 7%. I could anticipate probably in 2018, it's probably not gonna change that much, but more or less, this is the distribution. Um, we can also look further, what are the papers in these sessions are about? Um, so here we, we're looking at the top 10 most used words in the paper title, so we just kind of going a bit deeper into what are the papers are about, as you would expect. And the, and the fertility and family session, so the majority of the papers are about fertility. Interestingly, also the word Italy pop up. Um, then, aging, health, and mortality, it's not a surprising thing, mortality, health, and aging. So in this session, um, what about migration? Of course, it's migration. So that's kind of makes sense. And this is a session that I talk about history, development, and environment. And if you look through all this word, Fertility, mortality, migration, actually the word environment or climate change hasn't popped up at all. So in a sense of this 6% that I told you, it's, it's not even quite there. So I'm sort of digging further just to, to check out I, the, the, the previous slide was about the titles. So let's look at the words in the abstract. So we might have more pools of the result. So I look at the, the abstracts that contain, contain the word climate change, environmental change, natural disaster, flood, Wi-Fi, landslide, whatever I can think of. And I found, so across the, um, so the 10 years of EPC, we have 
in total, including paper from the poster sessions, 4,000 or so papers and 46 uh, on have contained this word. Um, fertility has 1,084 papers, migration 850, mortality 700. So as you can see, and we can also look at what institution uh, doing, uh, making this 46 paper. Practically, it's us. <laughs> if if, if Levin allow me to annex uh, Shanghai University, so it's seven papers from Wittgenstein Center, Shanghai University, and sort of NCA, which is you know the same group. So uh, basically, you know, not it's still not such a popular topic, I guess, apart from from us. Um, so we. We we wondering. We are very curious. So why it's such an important and relevant topic to demography? So why are so few demographer working on population and climate change? And I just have to say, this is Wolfgang's word, not my word. Are they narrow-minded? So we um, we posed the questions in the recent yearbook in the, of the Vienna yearbook of population research, or recent special issues. So we invited um, um, sort of. Thinkish them, sorry, uh, demographer. So we asked um, Anastasia Gage, who is the president of IUSSP, Adrian Hayes for ANU, Laurie Hunter, Jane Mankin, Peter McDonnell, she's a Peng from Fudan University, to sort of to contribute to, to answer why there's so few demographers working on this topic. So we could sort of summarize the answer um, this way. And actually, by the way, if you haven't picked up the copy of the Vienna yearbook yet, it's on the back. We have uh, 950 copies printed out. So if you want to take home as Christmas gift, that would be great. Um, <laughs> and if you're too busy to read the whole thing, we, we, we wrote a very nice introduction, at least uh, demographic debates and introduction would be great. OK, so um, the first reason um, that was given by, by, by these authors, um, historically, when you talk about population environment, so if you enter into the kind of quite controversial issues on limit to population growth, because there was a Malthusian argument on sort of too much population, then it put pressure on environmental resources. So if you talk about population and climate change, so that's also sort of, again, it provoked this idea of population control and that kind of thing. So it's sort of some demographers sort of shy away uh, from working on this topic, but of course Wolfgang, he's a brave man, so he's already since um, 2002 and 2012, so Wolfgang set up the global um, expert panel, um, which emphasized, so they um, uh, published a statement on population and sustainable development and emphasized how important demography is in contributing into estimates and forecasts of population dynamics in sustainable development research, which also include environmental change. Um, the second reason is that, at least in the, past, in the past, there were limitations in data and method. But right now, nowadays, there's a, um, you know, a bit advancement in computer program, the data, now the surveys, data nowadays, now, now today, it's mostly geo-coded, um, so we can link the demographic data or survey data and link it with climate data, which is, you know, in historically, you can get the climate data for all countries in the world from 1900 at least. So, in fact, we can do much more than before. Um, thirdly, well, climate change, the topic of climate change is a, it's a quite a complex topic. And so it's not only about climate science, but it's also linked to topics, which is other disciplines have been picked up before demography, such as disaster vulnerability, production and consumption. So economists have been doing a, a lot of this. So it's sort of, it's quite complex and require demographer to go beyond um, emphasis on just empirical relationships. We have to sort of unpack a little bit and try to understand the mechanisms, that kind of thing. So that's the third reason. The fourth reason is um, the lack, still the lack of interdisciplinary collaboration, but as you see at YASA and NCA, so that's a good example that it's happening, so it will be changing in the future. Um, the last reason is a limitation in funding, which is a bit of a dilemma, right? Because if you want to do the work on climate change, where do you submit your proposals to? If you go for the sort of natural science panel, they're going to kill off the social science project. So you can't really compete with natural science. 
And another side, if you submit to sort of the classic demography, sociology kind of panel, well, also it's not a, such a classic topic, it's probably not as fancy as migration, so that's also the difficulty in getting the funding. Um, right, so um, yes, but Wolfgang, of all these difficulties that I listed, Wolfgang, for him, um, he has already put forward this view ever since 1990s, actually 1991, that's the first, um, I guess that's the first publication that he made for the government of Mauritius. Actually, if you've been listened to Sergei's talk on the first day that he talked about productivity and good environment, you can see that's a good example. The first book that Wolfgang wrote on this field is in Mauritius. And then, um, then Wolfgang also sort of tried to um, establish, to make um, climate change research or environment research visible also in the amongst demographers, so in the IUSSP context, when he set up the Population Environment Research Network, he also shared a um, climate change panel with Lewen on, in IUSSP, and, and as you all know, Frank got, also got the ESC grant on um, forecasting society's adaptive capacity to climate change. 2014, he was also the lead author in IPCC assessment report, and now the recent news that we heard that you would be part of the UN um, on sustainable development goals. So, Wukang has been present in this research. Um, now I'm going to focus a bit more on our the major work that we have done at the Wittgenstein Center. So I also have the honor to be part of this good environmental context and productivity. <laughs> part of this Wolfgang Sergei Bangkok Phuket Talak place. So we organized a conference and in Kaulak, Kaulak is the area in the south of Thailand, which is the, uh, the so in Panga province, which is a province that um, it's the most damage from 2004 tsunami. So we sort of pick up this area in 2014 or so, sort of to commemorate the 10 years anniversary of tsunami in 2004. Um, so as you can see, the sea, the swimming pool, um, the excursion, the serious talk of Samir and Eric. Um, we had a nice dinner, but we also have the products which is the Vienna yearbook that you should pick up after this conference. <laughs> right. Um, so in this yearbook, I, actually, Brian already mentioned a little bit. So we collect, apart from demographic debates, we collect nine original articles that look at the differential vulnerability to, for example, floods and storms, the different mortality risk of different age group and sex, um, we also have a series of papers from Wolfgang, from Kisus, from Eric, from Samir that forecast vulnerability also into the future. And sort of part of, of, of this year book, we also transform it into the, the article in Nature Climate Change that we, we try to put forward the idea that we want climate scientists to take us seriously as well. So we, we try to say that, look, if you want to do um, climate change scenarios and projections, we are here, demographers are here, we can produce um, projections um, which consider population composition and demography you can forecast into the future. So it's, it's kind of useful also for climate um, scientists. Then another kind of I, I would say this is quite a major work or so that we have done, is to look at the role of education of human capital in um, vulnerability reduction and enhancing adaptive capacity. So it's, it's quite new actually, the, the idea that to put forward that education matters for, re, uh, for vulnerability reduction. So we sort of um, successfully, I would say, so um, it's the special issue in ecology and society edited by Wolfgang and Bill, and we collected a series of empirical evidence, both at the individual level, national level, cross countries in different um, um, contexts, geographical contexts, and show that education matters. And sort of, we also sort of transform um, some part of the evidence into the science article. Um, right, so, but before getting into this empirical evidence on how, why education matters. It's not such an easy task because the idea is, is was at least was relatively new um, five years ago. So me and Wolfgang, we sort of tried to think, sort of set up the idea why would education matters. 
Um, so you can think of the effect of education on vulnerability reduction in, in two ways. So one, the first one is the direct effects. We go to school, we improve our cognitive skills, problem solving skills. Highly educated people tend to have better risk perception, so that's a kind of direct effect. Um, for the indirect effects, as we all know, the highly educated also have better income, uh, better social capital, better social networks, better access to information. So these are all the kind of assets that is important in times of emergency or natural disaster. So this is the con concept, right? But to, um, to empirically prove this thing, it's not such an easy task. So, um, which is sort of part of my job when I first joined in Vienna. So I came in September 2011, and, and the very first day at work, so I was discussing with Wolfgang, like, uh, what kind of research focus that I should do. So he said three things to me. Um, so the first thing, Wolfgang asked me, do you want to go to Thailand? And I said, oh, of course, yes, because I am from, from Thailand, I always want to work on Thailand. So I said yes to the first question. Second thing he said to me, I have 20,000 euro for you to spend in Thailand. And I'm like, okay. So he, he um, set up the traps, <laughs> these two things. So Thailand, 20,000 euro. But the third thing, which, which left me kind of speechless, because he said, you know, um, we work on education, vulnerability, and natural disasters. And I thought I couldn't swear to him, right? So I just thought inside, like, Oh, I never heard of this thing, like, what, what do I do? And then off I went to Thailand. So I, I wasn't quite sure actually what should I do with this education vulnerability thing. Um, so I consulted my colleague at um, Chulalong Khan University. So she said, yeah, um, maybe we could start with the areas affected by 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. So maybe we can make a community survey. We, look at how people adapt to the climate change and so on. So, um, so I went to the area and I still didn't quite know what, what should I do actually. Until one day something happened that changed my life course also into this, this research. I'm pretty sure you don't know why, what happened in this 11th of April 2012. Um, so I was really right on the, on the coast area. There was an earthquake. That um, so the epicenter of this earthquake is, was more or less the same spot as the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, so which is here Banda Ache. So we were in the town hall, and um, straight away the staff in the town hall they they sort of shouting to a tsunami warning. So that was uh, 3 p.m. and so they said so 5 p.m. tsunami is going to come to Phuket and 6 p.m. it's going to come to Panga where we were, and. So I was actually quite panicked because I didn't know what to do. And, um, but we, we, we were right there at, at the place. So we, we were in the town hall, so we received all this warning, the timing of tsunami. So we were quite curious, actually, what about people really in the, on the village? Did they hear about this warning and everything? So, um, uh, so luckily, I, I'm pretty sure you haven't heard of this event because tsunami didn't really happen. So in 2004, the movement of the Earth crust was a vertical move, so it, so it shifted a huge amount of water this way. But this particular one, um, it's a horizontal move, so this way. So tsunami didn't happen, but it's a perfect natural experiment for us. So, you know, so we went back and then we collected the data of the village that located along the coast. Um, we asked a lot of questions, so says, did you evacuate? How did you hear about the warnings? And one particular question that I was interested in is, uh, are you um, prepared, have you done anything to prepare for the, the risk of earthquake or tsunami? So I'm not sure if you're familiar with disaster preparedness. So it's a kind of um, activities or measures that people do to try to reduce disaster risks, such as buying disaster insurance, reinforce your house, you might move, you might store water or emergency medicine, so that kind of activities. And in fact, we did find that, um, well, surprisingly, individuals, households, and community with at least secondary level of education, they have higher disaster preparedness, so the evidence is quite robust. 
Um, we also found that social capital also increased disaster preparedness. So Wolfgang sort of saw that we were quite productive in, in that survey. So in 2013, he did this again to me. He said, Raya, Thailand, 20,000 euro again, and this time I'm coming with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we were, <laughs> the thing is in 2013, I can't predict if there's gonna be any disaster or not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, of, okay, what, what, what should I do? What survey I have to do? So I thought, okay, let's pick up um, the area that, that are prone to disaster. So we still went back to Panga in the south, and uh, we pick up Ayutthaya. So that's a kind of, it's a central plain close to Bangkok. It's a flood um, prone area. And then Kalasin, which is uh, in the northeast, so it's a drought prone area, and sometimes it has a risk of flooding as well. Um, yeah, so Wolfgang also joined me to do some, some interviews. Um, so then we got an extremely very beautiful result from, from this project. Um, so on the x-axis, we have years of education. On the um, y-axis, it's a probability of carrying out disaster preparedness. It's a very simple analysis. It's a regression model controlling for relevant characteristics. But we split the sample into those who have disaster experience and those who have no disaster experience. So it's, it's very simple, as you would expect. People who experience disaster, they carry out disaster preparedness because you know how dangerous uh, disaster could be. Um, so they, yeah, the high proportion are doing disaster preparedness. But um, for those without disaster experience, you can see it's going up beautifully with years of education. So by the years, sort of 12 years of education onwards, the probability that they would carry disaster, do, a, do a disaster preparedness is more or less the same as those who, um, who, who have experienced disaster. So in a way, um, education sort of substitutes disaster experience. It gives you the, in psychology, it's called abstraction skills. So you can think about counterfactual how dangerous um, disaster could be without needing to experience it. And it's extremely beautiful because we found exactly the same thing in the Philippines. So it's sort of, I would say that this result is it's quite robust. Um, um, yeah, so I think I'm, I'm going to stop very soon. So what else can I do to keep Wolfgang happy and busy? Uh, so apart from the fact that I, I would still work on, on, on education, so I try to unpack a little bit and try to understand what education does to um, vulnerability reduction. So I also have papers that we use instrumental variable for pen score matching, so that's one side. But I think um, to make the Wittgenstein Center being even more visible in climate change, population climate change research, there are two topics that we can't avoid not doing it because it's a hot topic in climate change, which is health and migration. Um, so I already done some things, I'm not going to go through it in health. So we look, um, we look at um, climate variability and malnutrition. In, in Uganda, it's a UNICEF project, which is, can be easily expanded also to other countries. And um, we also started working on climate change and, and migration. I know Wolfgang has always said to me when I, when I, when I speak about climate change and migration, Wolfgang always said, you know that I am skeptical. And I actually might, I have the same response. I am also skeptical about climate change and migration because sometimes you heard um, people giving up this random number, 250, me 250 million environmental refugees, 1 billion environmental refugees, and I thought this is, indeed it's our job to enter into this field and sort of to see if there's a real link or not between this climate change conflict and migration. Maybe there is, maybe there's not, but we have manpower, we have the tools to do this type of research, so I think we, we would go forward to that. And um, if we can agree, <laughs> um, then uh, yeah, I think that's it. Happy birthday <laughs> from the Wittgenstein Center.